I want to welcome you to the Eagle Hills Church. I'm John Grimston, the pastor, welcoming those of you here in person and those watching us online. Glad to have you here with us. Uh, we are having celebrating Thanksgiving this week, a wonderful time and, uh, for us all. And uh, we want to greet and celebrate our visitors that are here with us today. If you brought somebody with you, love to have you introduce them. If you're visiting and you feel okay sharing, you know, uh, you can wait till you feel comfortable, but love to have you share. We do give out chocolate bars as our, as our incentive. So any guests or visitors here with us today? Seeing anybody? Okay. Yes. Hello there. Glad to have you with us. You are? Well, glad to have you here. Well, anyway, glad to have you here. Wow, okay. That's, that's one of the best introductions we've ever had. I, I've been here a long time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any others? Well, it is Thanksgiving, so I have lame jokes tied in with that. Are you ready for this to get us going? What did the mama turkey say to her naughty son? And the answer is... If your papa could see you now, he'd turn over in his gravy. <laughs> what do you get when you cross a turkey with a ghost? A poultry geist. <laughs> and the last one, I think it's the best one, but hey, maybe not. I shot my first Thanksgiving turkey this year. Scared the heck out of everybody down at the Winko. <laughs> so hopefully you're smiling, let's greet each other. Welcome to worship this morning. We wanted to do a, a hymn, a classic hymn sing here to start and uh, some Thanksgiving hymns. So let's uh, join in together, starting with We Gather Together. We gather together to ask the Lord's blessing, be Oh, 
Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time together today. We lift up our hearts to you, and we ask that you would just cleanse us from anything that is preventing us from being your faithful servants. We ask you to free us from all sins, to free us from all hindrances, to free us from all those things that are holding us back. We don't want to be an obstacle. We pray, Lord, to your work in the world. And we pray that our church may be a magnet, a place that draws people in, that invites them to come to know you more deeply, to walk with you more closely. We pray that we will be attracting people to us because your presence is here in this place. We want people to know you, Lord, to grow in you, and to be your children. We pray that our church might be this place of grace. We ask that our worship today be genuine, that our hearts be given over to you, that we really honor and glorify you, and that we are molded and shaped by your hands, that we are formed into your children, that we become your servants. So bless us in our worship today. Let it be genuine and real. Uh, bless us in our time uh, here together that our fellowship might be genuine. We ask, Lord, uh, for you to bless those in our congregation who are struggling mourning, who have lost loved ones, uh, those who are struggling with health issues for healing. And we pray also for those who are just going through different, difficult times in their relationships. We pray for restoration and reconciliation. We continue to pray for our government, for those in positions of leadership. We ask for gifts of wisdom and discernment. We pray for our president, our, our representatives in Congress, and for our leaders here locally. Bless them, we pray. And we ask also this day for your gifts of protection to be with our men and women in the armed forces. I'll watch over them, we pray, Lord. All these things we lift up in the sure hope we have in Jesus and his resurrection as we offer the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Stand and sing together, give thanks. Give thanks with a grateful Oh, my God. 
thanks. Please be seated. It was interesting hearing how we had, uh, we, I was singing us too, and then uh, uh, it was saying me up there on the, the screen, but it's, it's interesting thinking about how many of the blessings come to me as an individual and how many of them come to us as a, as a group. That's something we're actually going to touch on later on in the sermon, so it was maybe apropos that we had that. Well, a couple of things before we actually uh, do our, our offering today. One is that we're trying to honor different uh, uh, volunteers in our church in various ways, and today we're going to be honoring those who are involved in our hospitality ministries. And boy, that's a hard one. Where do you draw the line on what's a hospitality ministry and what isn't? So we're going to be pretty inclusive there, and I'm going to make it a little different this time. I'd like those who are involved that I call up to come up here and line up. We have a little gift for, for some of you to do that, but let's, let's talk about hospitality. I would say Sunshine Committee would be one. So could I have those who are involved with our Sunshine Committee come up here and line up here? That's our group that provides food uh, for people going through a difficult time, but especially for funerals and uh, receptions that we do for that. I also want to include those who are involved with our coffee bar ministry. So that's another bunch. Cookies, those who make cookies for us Sunday morning. Heaven knows they should be honored, <laughs> as well as others. Our card writers, those who write the cards for us and doing that. I know some of them are here. Okay. And also, those who do lunch with the pastor, I know that's, that's Gene and Lisa. They're doing Sunday school now, so no prior gifts for them. Uh, no, we'll, we'll make sure they get some later. And then I know we have uh, uh, people who help with our barbecues and potlucks who are in there, and I don't mean, you know, they help a little bit, but they're really responsible for them. So, Rudy, that's got to be you. Okay, come on down. Anybody? So these are the folks we wanted to, and we have a flower to give uh, each of them. Men, of course, we thought, hey, they probably don't want a flower, so you're getting a t-shirt. <laughs> I don't know if that's good. But uh, let's say a prayer over these ministries. Oh, an information booth. Did I forget the information booth? Meant to have that. Okay, probably already up here. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for these people, for their welcoming presence that uh, makes our church feel like a home and that makes us all feel included and involved. We thank you for their gifts of time and energy and all that they do. And we pray that these ministries will indeed make people uh, well, feel welcomed in our home, that our, place, our church will be a place that draws in gifts and visitors and families and children and, and adults. We lift that all up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So a gift coming your way. Let's give them a round of applause, too, and thank them for their work here. And if you do want to get involved in those ministries, there's some sign-up sheets out there in the hallway. I hope you'll take advantage of those. Next thing, while they're getting those flowers, I did want to mention we have these Connect cards that are in there again. If you're new and want to be involved, in, you know, get your name in on our e-blast so that you're getting some communications about our church or so that we can put you in our database. We'd love to be able to do that. Put it in the offering plate when you fill it out. And we have shawls here, obviously, third Sunday of the month. The shawls that are here, uh, first of all, I wanted to, um, I got a note from Susan. She says, we have made now 2,127 prayer shawls and given away 2,081 of them. That means there's 46 shawls on the rails looking for homes. All right? That's kind of neat to know that there's that many. Uh, these are to be given to people who might be going through a difficult time as a sign just of uh, God's presence with them. And, of course, we pray over everybody who receives them. These shawls were all knitted and made and crocheted with prayer, too. Wonderful ministry of our church. So we'll lift them up. And I was asked to tell you that last uh, uh, on Veterans Day, we had a bunch of quilts that were out here uh, two weeks ago. And they were, uh, a bunch were taken here, but others were taken over to the Veterans uh, Home where they were distributed there to veterans. So let's pray over these. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the hands that have made these shawls, and we pray that those who receive them will know your presence and your comfort during a time of difficulty. Bless those who receive them and let them know that your people are praying for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, amen. And now let us worship the Lord with our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. And if you would, uh, uh, put in those Connect cards. That'd be great.
Holy Spirit, we ask that you would bless these gifts, consecrate them for your work, and uh, bless those who give them, that we might give ourselves fully and completely over to your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. We've been looking at the prophet Micah, calling it Mission in Micah, and today we really get to the mission part of this uh, sermon series. We've been looking at Micah, whose career was sometime about 730 B.C. to around 680 B.C., during the time of the divided kingdom. So there's Israel in the north, which is larger, more populous, more prosperous. There's Judah in the south, which is smaller and poorer. Both countries struggled with sin. And both of them receive a word of judgment through the prophet Micah, but also a word of hope. Uh, The word of judgment comes because they're practicing idolatry, number one. And idolatry is running after other gods. This is a covenant community that's meant to be in relationship with God, and yet they're not living that way. They're running after other gods, after other idols. They're not being faithful to the Lord. And directly related to that because they don't live in right relationship with God. They're also living in wrong relationship with one another. The rich and the powerful are exploiting the poor and the weak, and especially the leaders who should be watching out for people, those in government, in the judicial system, the religious leaders. They've all been exploiting the poor and the weak. Micah gives a prophetic word of judgment, and boy, that troubles us. You know, we don't like to hear words of judgment. We like to hear the words of hope and restoration and skip over that part. But of course, throughout the scriptures, we see that God is a judge, a God who cares passionately that we do right to one another, and a God who acts to see that his justice is fulfilled on this earth. Micah gives this word that destruction is coming because things are so out of whack. Uh, But he also says uh, uh, that that will come first in the north and later in the south. But the coming destruction, he says, will not be the end. Restoration will take place. God will work to renew, rebuild better than before. Chapters 1 through 3 that we've looked at already consisted primarily of prophetic proclamations that terrible disasters were coming, fitting punishments for the disgraceful behavior of Israel and its leaders. Chapters 4 to 5 mostly I talked about promises that things will get better, but not until the difficult times already set in motion have run their course. And now in this closing section, we get a mixture of judgment and hope, but hope has the last word. Now, there are three famous passages in Micah. We looked at two of them last week. One was beating the swords into plowshares. That's a beautiful picture of the hope we have that peace will finally come and war will end. The second one is uh, passages that uh, prophecy about uh, the coming Messiah. Bethlehem is talked about as the city where Jesus would be born. Uh, But you, Bethlehem, you know, we hear those words every year during the Advent season. But today we're going to look at the most famous verses in uh, in this, uh, Micah 6, verse 8, ones that are the favorite for many people. Uh, Many people tell me that they're they're not only their favorites, but the words they try to live by. Do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. So let's look at chapter 6, beginning with verse 1, and see what it has to tell us. It starts off with these words, listen to what the Lord says. And uh, then it has something here that's going to sound funny to our ears, but would have been normal for people to hear in the past. Stand up and plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. We don't usually talk to the hills and the mountains because... Well, I guess you could say they do talk back sometimes when you yell loud enough, you get an echo. But most of the time, we think of them as inanimate, so why would we talk? But in the ancient world, one of the common poetic metaphors was to say, well, let's have a court case. Let's see about a trial, and let's bring everything together so we can hear all the evidence. And who knows more? Well, the mountains and the hills, they've been there. Uh, They've heard and seen it all. So God calls on them, the kings call on them. It's poetic license to call on them to be witnesses and to bear uh, uh, forth the truth. Then he says, hear you mountains, verse 2, the Lord's accusation. So God's got a a case that he's going to make against his people. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth, for the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. 
All right, so he's going to bring a, 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 a charge against them. And then he starts off, instead of giving the charge, he says, My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. So he says, what have I done? I've done good things for you is what he's going to say, but you're acting as though I've done bad things for you. And now he's going to list the good things that he has done. Uh, I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. Well, that would be the big one we think of, right? The Exodus experience. He rescued them with a mighty hand. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam. So I gave you leaders. And it's interesting, he lists the whole family of, of Moses. We usually leave out Aaron and Miriam. Miriam was his sister, in case you don't remember. Aaron was his brother. And then he says, not only did I do that, but verse 5, my people remember what Balak, king of Moab, plotted and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered. And now most of you are going, what the heck is he talking about here? So in other words, he's saying, I rescued you with a mighty hand from slavery, but it didn't stop there. I continue to do mighty acts to save you down through your history. One of them was uh, Balaam was hired, you may remember this story, to go and give a curse on the people of Israel. And God intervened, and instead of giving a curse, he gave a blessing. Okay, And what he's saying is, I turned your curses into blessings. And then he goes on to say, uh, remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. Well, in other words, this is when they were getting ready to cross the Jordan River and enter into the Promised Land. I was there helping you, aiding you. It's this way of saying, I didn't just save you once, I continue to save you over and over again throughout your history. I've been there all along, I've been your support and strength. Verse 6, so God tells what he has done. He says, I haven't done anything bad. I've helped and blessed you. And then the people kind of respond in this way. What, with what shall I bow down before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? So if God's upset with us, what does he really want? What does he de demand of us? And they're going to say, well, he must want more from us than we've been giving. And this is their answer. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings with calves a year old? So they start off by saying, God must want more sacrifices. That's, that's the answer. God is saying that we should give more. So let's go and give burnt offerings. Now, I will tell you that a lot of the offerings and sacrifices that people brought in ancient Israel were Thanksgiving offerings and other types of offerings where they would bring it into the priests, they would offer it up, and then the priests would give some to the poor, some back to them, some be shared, right? Those were many of the offerings. But a whole burnt offering was a way of just saying, I'm giving it all to God. So that was seen as being especially good, right? Uh, giving it all to the Lord. I was trying to think of a comparison to that today, but, uh, you know, maybe buying like a stained glass window or something. You know, it doesn't really, it's just beautiful. We see it as a gift to God, right? Uh, so that's the kind of thing here. A whole burnt offerings or calves a year old. If you're going to offer a sacrifice, a calf a year old, that's good eating. You know, that's the best ones. It's the prime rib, so to speak, of the, uh, of the ancient world. And so quality. God must want more quality from our offerings. And then verse 7, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? Well, now we're talking quantity. Is it quality or quantity God wants? Sacrifices. With 10,000 rivers of olive oil. I don't know how much a river of olive oil would be, but I can't imagine 10,000 of them. You, you just get this picture of the altar just flowing with an ocean of olive oil and all these rams that are being offered. And then it goes on, shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul, the most important thing I have. So their immediate response is to say, maybe we're not sacrificing enough or of high enough quality. What does God really want? But the answer is going to be, it's not about the outward religious things they're doing. Uh, those are maybe okay and good, but what he's really saying is their hearts are not in the right place. It's not accompanied by a dedication to justice and righteousness, not accompanied by a commitment to God. And then in verse 8 is the key verse for us today. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? So God has already told you what you need to do. What does the Lord require of you? Here's the answer. To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So we're going to look at that verse in depth. Before we do, I just want to recap a little bit of what we heard here in this passage. First of all, God sounds like a parent in some of these passages, doesn't he? You know, like he's scolding them. 
I, I was recapping it in this way. You know, I've done everything for you kids to prepare you for life, and now you're sitting in the basement playing video games and eating cheese puffs. <laughs> right? A little more serious than that, though. What he's really saying here is, you know, I rescued you. I gave you all so many uh, wonderful things. I blessed you in so many ways. And instead of following me and worshiping me and living in a relationship with me and blessing those around you, instead, you're falling after, or running after other gods and you're ripping one another off, okay? God is really challenging them to live differently. So let's make this parallel clearer between them and us. I'm going to ask you this question, and this is a good one for us as Thanksgiving is here. What has God done for you, right? What has God done for you? And I'm really asking you, let's see some hands and hear some words. What has God done for you? Okay, kept you healthy. Anyone else? Opportunity for everlasting life. That's a big one, isn't it? Okay. He's given us a chance to be in relationship with him now and forever. What else? Okay, blessing our families. Yeah. Healthy children, remember? He walks with us. He's in relationship with us, being there, supporting us. Guiding us, gracing us, changing us. Yeah. Giving you a beautiful home to live in. Okay, yeah. He healed my brain after I fell and injured it. So after you fell and injured your brain, he healed it. Okay. All right. We, forgiveness of sins. We, we could go on and on about the things that Jesus has done for us, the grace that he has given us. And now the real question is, what does God want from us? Right? That's the real question here that they're asking. Well, think about that. Now, many people misunderstand part of what we heard in today's scripture lesson. They think that it is an attack against sacrifices. I always tell folks that sacrifice is, a, is something that you, you, you give that, that uh, uh, bec- something you give up because you love something else more. The sacrifices were meant to reinforce their devotion to God and to identify God as the primary love of their life, to ask for his grace and forgiveness and to build that into their, their worship system. But the real issue here is not the quantity or the quality of the sacrifices. It has to do with the attitude they were bringing to their sacrifices. You can't really worship God and say he's the priority of my life when I am worshiping other gods. You can't really say God's the priority of my life when I'm ripping off my neighbor, uh, uh, right? I can't Say, I love God and hate my neighbor. It's impossible. So what he's really saying here is it isn't about the quality and quantity of our sacrifices. The parallel I would give to you is this. Maybe some of you have been there before. When we're in a crisis, sometimes we want to bargain with God. And we want to say, okay, God, if you do this for me, then I will go to church every Sunday. I will give my tithe. I will uh, become a... Sunday school teacher or a helper or a missionary or a pastor, and we hear that and you go, wow, is that what God really wants? I mean, those are all good things. The sacrifices were good things. The problem isn't the quantity or the quality of them. The attitude of the heart is what's important. So I think that what God really wants is not just for you to show up at church and be pew fodder. God wants to be in a living, vital relationship with you, right? And, and, and that's critical. You're no more a Christian because you show up here in church on Sunday than you are a car because you go into a garage, right? What kind of relationship do you have with the Lord? And as far as money, well, yes, the Bible tells you, I think, 3,000 times to give to the poor and to bless them, right? We're supposed to be doing and giving from our, our resources. But I will tell you that giving without having the right attitude of the heart doesn't get us anywhere, right? It's just money then. It's not really establishing that priority. And service, you know, being a a teacher or a a missionary or a pastor or whatever it is, who wants one that doesn't really believe and have a vital relationship with Jesus? You know, we don't want that. We want somebody who's really connected. So the question is really not about what we are doing as it is about the attitude with which we're doing it. By the way, there's a passage in the New Testament that says this explicitly very famous passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, in the opening verses. What does it say? If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. 
If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to the flames that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. So what is that saying? It's saying, well, if I speak all the languages, if I have all the wisdom and knowledge, if I have all the faith, if I have all the ability to prophecy, if I have faith such I'm willing to even give my life for it, uh, but I don't have love, it's not worth anything. I could give away everything, it says. That doesn't matter. It's the attitude I'm doing it, the love that I have. So I mentioned 6.8 as the key verse in this that we're going to spend the most time on. The key word in that verse is often missed. It is walk. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? Walk. That means a living, vital relationship. It's the kind of relationship we were created to have. Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the garden, right? And and Jesus came and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I think that's a close connection between way, right? The early followers of Christ were called followers of the way. We read about that in Acts, referred to it five different times, and in 2 Peter and in Hebrews. And of course, 1 John says, uh, uses the metaphor of walking, and it says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Walking with somebody, that's about a relationship, right? When uh, you go hiking in the mountains, have you ever run into somebody who's going the same way you are, but you don't really know them, and all of a sudden you're walking in the same, it even happens on the street. You know, if you're living in an area like we do, not probably in New York City, but if you're walking along and all of a sudden there's somebody walking with you and you don't know them, you want to go slower or faster, right? Because it seems weird to walk with somebody you're not in a relationship with. It seems kind of bizarre. I don't want to do that. I want to walk with the people I walk with. That happened to me running the other day. I was running along and uh, somebody uh, stepped in from another path and lo and behold, we were running the same speed. And I thought, I can't do this. It seems too weird, (laughs) right? So I stopped and let her go. It was a woman. And I let her get you know, about a quarter mile ahead. And then I thought, now I'm going to go because it just seemed bizarre, right? Walking is about that relationship we have, vital relationship with someone. And we want to have that kind of relationship with God. And then it says walk humbly. Now that means it's not about me. It's recognizing my need for God and who God is and how great God is. The word actually is a difficult one to translate because it could mean cautiously or carefully. That seems bizarre, but think about it. We're supposed to have an awe or a fear of God. God is holy. And so, yeah, we recognize our need for God, but also there's an awe and a fear kind of thing that goes on there, too, that we're supposed to have. And then it says this, do justice and love mercy. I have a brother who uh, I'm never sure about where he is in his faith, but he reads the Bible all the time. And this is his favorite verse in the Bible. And he always has told me repeatedly that he loves this verse, but he thinks it's impossible to do because justice and mercy are opposites from one another, right? They're complete opposites. You know, to do justice means to follow the rules. To mercy is to allow for the breaking of the rules to take place, et cetera. Most of you probably are thinking that going, huh, he's got a point. I want to tell you he's misunderstanding what the words justice and mercy mean. So justice, first of all, does not have to do with a set of rules that you're following. It's about living in right relationship. Justice means living in right relationship with God and our neighbor, right? Doing acts of justice then, well, we misunderstand this. You know, sometimes you hear people say, I'm a good person. You ask them what it means, and it means, well, I'm not a murderer or a thief. That's a funny definition of being a good person, right? I mean, the negatives that are, that, that are there. But even if that was the case, you know, I'm not doing these negative things. Most of us are smart enough to know we are all sinners who fall short of the glory of God. So there are negative things we do. But then justice isn't really about a balance sheet or getting things right or wrong or more pluses or doing good things even. It's really about that living in right relationship, which we do through the grace and forgiveness of God. The mercy of God makes that possible. And we are to be people who are trying to be a blessing to our communities, but also be vehicles of mercy. What is mercy? Well, sometimes we equate mercy and grace. They're related to one another. Grace is getting good things or God giving us good things that we don't deserve. Mercy is us not getting the things that we deserve, right? Because we often deserve punishments or or, or penalties. So mercy is the flip side of this. And boy, 
I will tell you that in our personal relationships, having both of those, the desire to bless and to be a blessing to those around us, and that desire to give mercy are essential for maintaining right relationships, right? Can you imagine your family, what it would be like if you guys weren't trying to be a blessing to one another? And what it would be like if you didn't give mercy and grace when people made mistakes? What kind of homes would we live in, right? We want to have those two characteristics together because they enable us to walk in relationship with God and with one another. That's what we desire here and what we're seeking and want. Well, you know, this thing started out as a trial. You know, God putting the people on trial. And uh, years ago, there used to be a common sermon thing. I, I don't think I've used it in years, so it can't be that common anymore. Maybe, maybe. It, it was this, you know, if you were put on trial today for your Christian faith, would there be enough evidence to convict you? You know, this is really a, 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 God is really saying that kind of a question here. What have I done? Where are you at in your faith? I look at the evidence and it really is saying you're going in the wrong way. This is a chance for us to think about where God is calling us to go and to be. But the real challenge I have for you today is this one. Uh, what does this verse really mean for you? Are you, in fact, doing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly with your God? That's the real question for us to think about. And a good one for Thanksgiving time, when we're thinking about all the things God has done for us. There was a prayer in our study this week that I was going to close this sermon with before we have our hymn uh, and before we do our prayer and anointing with oil. It's uh, from the Africana Book of Worship. Uh, just join with me in the spirit of prayer. Give us, O Lord, an eye for injustice. For it is only when we are able to recognize injustice and feel its awful sting that we will be moved to make things right. Give us, O Lord, a tender heart. Sometimes we are too hard-hearted to recognize what we have been when we have been uncaring, unfeeling, or unkind. Grant us, O Lord, the ability to view life from the dust. All our lives we have been taught to make others proud, to be proud of ourselves, to hold our heads high, all the while missing the virtues of being poor in spirit. Teach us, dear Lord, to do justice, love kindness, and to walk humbly with you. Amen. Once a month, we give people an opportunity to receive prayer and anointing. Uh, we remember that anointing was done in the Bible as a mark of healing, a mark of the presence of the Holy Spirit, of consecration and blessing. So if you have a special need or joy, we invite you to come forward at this time for prayer and anointing with oil. I'm going to get my oil.
to the tune and rhythm of the doxology. today I do have a few announcements. First of all, I want to say a lot of you obviously read the, the e-blast this week because I see this section which has been the most empty and which we film the most is now full. Thank you. We are trying to leave the back rows a little bit open for some of the folks who come in uh, late. So that usually is our visitors. So remember and keep that in mind too. Today, right after the service, in a few minutes, we'll be gathering back here to hear a little bit more about our next step as we're looking through our future for our church and hearing our committee's report. They'll give this one more in January, that's late January, and then we'll be uh, hearing presentations in smaller groups, but that we'll be making our vote presumably shortly thereafter. Next week is Stewardship Sunday. We'll keep it low key, uh, but you will be asked to make a, 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 an estimate of giving for the coming year. That will help us. And coming up, you see announcements about Hanging of the Greens and uh, Christmas and Eagle. So I hope you'll join us for those events. And now may the grace, the peace, and the love of God be yours this day and always, forevermore. Amen.